The play on the field, the courts, and the ice is just one part of sports. Behind every game are the people hard at work so we can enjoy the action. They're the owners, administrators, agents, broadcasters, and promoters who bring the games to life. Meet them when you go behind the game with Patrick Klinger and Bill Robertson. Welcome to Behind the Game. I'm Patrick Klinger, president of Agile Marketing Partners. Alongside me, my co-host, well, alongside me virtually today, my co-host, a man who was voted the most improved player on his JV baseball team during his senior year at Creighton Durham High School. Bill, three hops to short, Robertson. <laughs> Billy, it's great to see you. Great to see you, you Patrick. Happy you New Year. You yeah, and- same to you, Billy. You don't typically we'd be in studio, of course, today, but some technical problems prevent that. So it feels a little bit like 2020. We're back doing Zoom, but we've got a really fantastic guest today with us that I'm excited about. And I'll let you introduce him. Sure. Well, we have a, a phenomenal guest and uh a uh, in my mind, uh, the top and premier uh play-by-play baseball broadcaster in the country and Corey Provis, who is currently the Minnesota Twins announcer on WCCO radio and also does college football and basketball for the Big Ten Network. So Corey Provis, welcome to Behind the Game. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, thanks to have, for having me on your show. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. Well, we're going to just jump right into these questions, Corey. And uh, I know you're getting ready for spring training here at it's less than a month away, and that's an exciting time with pitchers and catchers reporting. And and uh, down in Florida, it should be a lot of fun. But um, you've been named three times uh, Sportscaster of the Year for the Upper Midwest region. Uh, obviously, your career has skyrocketed since you've been to Minnesota. Um, what got you interested in getting into broadcasting right away as a, as a young man? I, you know, I grew up in the uh, Chicagoland area. I'm from the uh, northern suburbs of Chicago, and I grew up in just a great era of, of, of Chicagoland sports highlighted by Michael Jordan. Um, I was a kid as Michael Jordan was was dominating, uh, you know, the NBA and, and really the globe for that matter. So it was just this big interest in sports as I was a kid, and I just... I, I just fell in love with the sports and playing them as much as I could. But at a pretty young age, I realized that my athletic peak and my athletic reality were not exactly in sync. So I probably had my athletic peak when I was about seven, uh, when I was a short, tubby kid and could hit a softball a pretty good distance, but couldn't run. Uh, but after that, uh, everybody else got bigger and I stayed short. Thankfully, the, uh, the baby fat went away. Uh, but I just I loved sports growing up. And my cousin has been calling the Dallas Cowboys for more than 40 years. Uh, Brad Champ is my is my first cousin. My mom's the youngest of four. And my mom was was my was my cousin's aunt when she was about five. That was kind of the age gap between Brad's mom and my mom. So my love of sport and then realizing that I had somebody in my family that you know, wait a minute, you could, you could do this for a living. You have this passion for sport. And even though you can't play it, you can still be around it and talk about it. So you combine all that with what was going on. And I, as, as, as a kid growing up and I, I love the Cubs. So I'd listen to, to Harry Carey. I even remember Jack Brickhouse. My dad would, would play Jack Brickhouse for me on WGN. Jim Durham was doing the bulls. Um, you know, Pat Foley was calling the Blackhawks. Um, Wayne Larrabee was calling the Bears on WGN as well. I mean, so you just you combine all those interesting moments when I was a kid and my love of sport and I had family in the business. That was really the impetus behind me pursuing this career. Corey, your athletic career and mine sound a lot alike. <laughs> yeah. 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 I heard, you know, I heard Creighton and uh, we all couldn't be Joe. Right. Uh, you know, there, were, there was a Joe Mauer and then there was the leftover crap. And I was uh, I was certainly in the leftover crap department. You were just 30 years old when you stepped into the broadcast booth with Bob Euchre to broadcast Milwaukee Brewers games. Um, what did it feel like to 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 join somebody who was so beloved, so accomplished and, and frankly, so much older than you? 
what what prepared me for that was the, the the two prior seasons that I was working for my hometown team. I mean, I was 28 years old and working on the Cubs radio broadcast the WGN, which was my dream. That was that was my dream was to be a part of the, the Cubs radio broadcast. And here I was at 28 years old, hosting the pre and post game show, called the fifth inning with Ron Sano every day, uh, traveling with the team. I feel like you know, I won the lottery. I mean, it was it was a wild experience, but you know, I knew Ron Sando growing up by listening to him. My dad knew Ron Sando as the player. And it, it didn't take long to, to realize that Ron was this iconic, iconic figure that at, at various times, and when I was with the Cubs for two years, 07 and 2008, they were good teams. They went to the playoffs in both years. But Sando was the star. I mean, they had some really good players of Derek Lee and Carlos Zambrano and uh, Alfonso Soriano and Kerry Wood. But Ron Santo was the star when Ron, when the team bus would pull up at the hotel and there'd be hundreds of people waiting in the lobby, Cub fans in Cincinnati, wherever we were, Pittsburgh, that they wanted to see Ron and they wanted to take a picture and get an autograph with Ron. And part of my job uh, with Ron was to be with him every step of the way because he he, he lost both of his legs, uh, you know, due to diabetes as a kid. And he had, he had two prosthetics. And so he just needed some help uh, to get from A to B quite often. So I was there to help him with his bags and make sure that we just got him to where he needed to be. So I was with Ron all the time. So I was the one, you know, this was pre-selfies here. So I was the one that was often, hey, would you mind taking a picture? Would you mind taking a picture? Or be like, Corey, you know, hold my stuff while I sign. Okay. So that's what I did. But he was this iconic guy. And then when I got the job in Milwaukee, I was like, okay. I've been through this before a little bit. It's different because Ron was an icon to baseball and to Cub fans, whereas Bob is an icon in any genre. I mean, I'm not just talking about baseball. I'm talking about film. I'm talking about TV, commercials, Carson. He he just had this connection to so many different generations. You know, my generation of Bob Uecker, I knew him as Harry Doyle. But then behind me was going to be the Miller Lite commercials. And then beyond that, you're talking about the Tonight Show. And not to mention, he did play. I mean, he, he makes fun of his playing career, uh, which he probably should, but the guy played. Um, and so he just was, he was a fascinating guy. And what I often tell people is that you have them in a baseball season. Your team is struggling. You may have 20 games in 20 days. You've lost 10 out of 12. And man, you're tired. You, you just love that day off. And it's not there yet. It's maybe two or three, four days away. You just got back at two or three in the morning. You got to get back in the booth and do it again that night. And whenever I had that bad day, that went away right as we went on the air. Because I looked and I was sitting on the left and Bob was to my right. And, you know, two feet to my right is one of the best to ever do it. Any, any negative energy I was feeling, any fatigue I was feeling, that dissipated because I knew for three and a half hours, I was going to laugh and I was going to learn. Well, Bob Uecker is obviously known to so many as Mr. Baseball, Corey. Uh, I don't think he gets enough credit as a really good announcer, uh, both play by play and as an analyst. When he used to work on the game of the week, the Monday night games for ABC, he was exceptional and had to manage Al Michaels and Howard Cosell in particular, but those were great times and great memories for me of Bob Euchre. But were you ever on the receiving end of any of his practical jokes uh, on air or even off air for that matter? It's, it's a good question. So uh, my first year in Milwaukee was 2009 and Pat Hughes, who's going into uh, baseball's hall of fame this summer, the legendary voice of the Cubs and one of my dear friends and, and truly one of my mentors and, a lot of how I sound and what I do is because of Pat. Uh, Pat was in that chair for 12 years. Before Pat got the Cub job, he was Bob's broadcast partner for 12 years. So when I left Pat and Ron to, to move up to Milwaukee and, and join WTMJ for the 2009 season, you know, Pat said something to me that, that didn't resonate at the time, but then later in the year, I got it. He said, you know that you're in and you know that Bob likes you and wants to work with you and be around you when he gets to the point that he wants to make you laugh uncontrollably on the air. And that happened twice during that 2009 season, most notably towards the end. 
2009, Milwaukee got off to a good start, but they faded second half of the season, not a playoff year. We're finishing the season in Cincinnati. And so when we're at home, we could build the, the broadcast in a certain way that we didn't carry the national anthem live at home. We'd run commercials, we'd run other production, but on the road, it was whatever we had to go off the home team's format and, and timing sheet. So on the road, we would often carry parts, if not all, of the national anthem. So this particular weekend in Cincinnati, wrapping up the 2009 season, there's some kind of event taking place on the field pregame that there's, there's music, there's dancing, there's a lot of color. There's just a lot of cultural action happening on the field. And there was this one uh, artist that imagine the, the, the TV show, The Simpsons. So you have Marge Simpson, that towering blue head of hair, but substitute the hair and put in like every piece of produce imaginable. Okay. It's a, it's about a three foot tower of uh, pears and apples and bananas and you name it, any piece of produce towering on this woman's head. So she is, she is singing the national anthem. And so we get it back from break and the way that our format was built is that, you know, Bob would take it out of that last break and then I would do the starting lineups, throw it to break, come back, and then we start the game. So we're coming back from break and we hear the last probably 30 seconds of the national anthem. Now, 80 previous times, 79 previous times that that happened. This is again, game 81 of the road schedule. So game 162 of the season, whatever it was, Bob would say, you know, Betty Johnson with our national anthem. The lineups, here's Corey. But for some particular reason, Bob, I'm just waiting for that, right? And we hear the last few bars of the anthem, and he says, the Chiquita Banana with our <laughs> national anthem. The lineups, here's Corey. <laughs> and I had nowhere to go. I had nowhere to go. I, I, had, I had to read a sponsor card. I had to get the lineups. And, uh, he, you know, he didn't turn his mic off. He's right there. He's like, you okay? You all right? All right. No, you're doing fine. You're good. And it was really hard. It was really hard to put together uh, that, that last segment. So it's that, you know, Danny and I now, we have those moments too. They happen in spring training when there's more levity to it. But I, I don't fear them, and I'm not as embarrassed by them because it's, it's human nature but man, when, when, when Bob did that, that first time, and it happened multiple times the next two seasons, but that first time, I'll never forget it. And uh, whenever I go back to Cincinnati for interleague play, man, I hope it's that same event. I'm just waiting. I've been there, but I've not seen that same festival taking place on the field before the game. Uh, that's a fantastic story. Corey, you took over as the Minnesota Twins radio play-by-play -play broadcaster in, in 2012. Uh, you took over for John Gordon, who's in the Twins Hall of Fame. Your style is decidedly different than John's, uh, but you seem to to acclimate to the marketplace really quickly. And the fans acclimated to you. How do you go about stepping into a, a new community and adapting? Yeah. You know, I was asked, Patrick, you're familiar with this event. You know, you'll know what I'm talking about here, but I had no idea what I heard about Twins territory. I, I, you know, it was, it was a good marketing slogan and it, it just blended well with the team, but I did not understand it until Twins Caravan and the guy that, that hired me for, for this job. And I'll, I'll, I'll think of him fondly for the rest of my life. Uh, his name is Andy Price and Andy was the director of broadcasting at the time. And without him, I'm not here uh, because he, he believed in me from the get go when I never thought I was going to get the job. I it just never did. Um, but Andy, that first year, he sent me out at about five or six different caravan legs. And I was going north and south. I was going into Iowa. And I had no idea what Twins territory was until I experienced that. And then as you're stopping along the way, um, you know, going out to, to Minot with, with Gardy or going to Albert Lee with Glenn Perkins or going up to International Falls with, with Jack Morris, you, go, you do these affiliate interviews along the way. And, and this one station asked me a question and I was, I was stunned by it, but it made a lot of sense. He said to me, now, John Gordon, for more than two decades, he could tell you every single affiliate 
throughout Twins territory. We're talking about five states, uh, probably close to 85, 90 radio stations, and he knew every single one. And I thought, you're kidding me. That's amazing. I, I still don't. I still can't do it. But when, when, when he asked me that, I was like, all right, I got to do more research. It's more than just reading you know, Herb Carneal's book. It's more than just reading through every single media guide. It's really listening to people and listening to their stories. And even though I've heard Jack Morris talk about 1991 50 times, it may be time 51 for me, but for somebody sitting in, in International Falls and hearing Jack's version of Game 7 and 91, th this means the world to them. So just taking a step back from your role and what you do and listening to these people and listening to how passionate these people are about their team, how loyal they are about their team, how much they want their team to win and succeed. You almost, you're almost ignorant and naive if you don't buy in and do your prep and do your homework. And for me, it wasn't just about, I, I can't be John. It was just going to be another chapter in people's lives. I never looked at it as I'm replacing John Gordon. It's not. I mean, John's legacy lives on. It always will live on. I just want to be the next chapter for as many years as as many pages and years as the twins will have me. Corey, I know you had said at the outset you were born and raised in the Chicagoland area. Um, you've worked with the Brewers and then you worked for your hometown Cubs growing up on, on the north side of Chicago. Um, how hard is it to have an allegiance or change the allegiance to these teams as you go? So you went from the Cubs, who, who you revered growing up, and you went to the Brewers, and now to the Twins, and you've been with the Twins for a long time, a staple for anybody listening to Twins baseball on, on radio. But is that allegiance hard to, to get to over time, or does that come naturally for you? I, I, had to win, I had to win Milwaukee fans over um, the hard way because Cubs fans – Geographically, maybe some always view the Brewers as a rival, but that's not a tradition-rich rivalry. That, until Milwaukee moved to the National League, you know, the, the, the Twins and Brewers, that was a great you know, American yes. League yearly rival. But Milwaukee, it, if you've been up there, and it, for many that live on the north side of Chicago, it's often easier, uh, north of the city, even the northwestern suburbs, it probably is easier to go see the Cubs play in Milwaukee than it is to either travel to Wrigley Field, get a ticket to Wrigley Field. So when when the Brewers and Cubs would play in Milwaukee, I mean, it was still a majority Milwaukee crowd, but it wasn't, it was, we're not talking about 80-20 here, maybe 60-40, depending on the teams, how they were doing, it could be close. And Milwaukee fans, they, they didn't love me right away because I, I admitted to everybody, I grew up a diehard Cub fan. I can't do much about that. I didn't grow up in, uh, in Waukesha. I didn't grow up in, in Eau Claire. Um, I didn't grow up in Green Bay and pick the Cubs over the Brewers. I grew up in the Chicagoland area, and that was my team. But there were I, I, I would see it. I, I'd get emails about it. I had fan interaction that they just they weren't sold on me yet because I was this outspoken Cub fan, um, you know, for a couple of years and, and all my years growing up. Um, but – that starts to go away a little bit when you start to lose relationships with players. That, that 2009 season was the toughest because the Cub team was so fresh in my mind and in my heart that so many of those guys that I got to know were still on that team. But as the years go by, I don't have those personal connections with, with, with the Cub players today or, or the Milwaukee players today that I did when I was younger. Some of the front office, some of the training staff, you know, that's that those are, you know, the, the guys that, that work in the clubhouse, and, you know, director of team travel. Those guys are still around broadcasters, of course. But I, I think that you just can't lie uh, to people that I grew up a baseball fan and I grew up in the Midwest. And then I just I, I don't want to be a know it all that it's OK for me to say when somebody would ask me a twins question, I still live by this today that I'd rather say either on the air or in an interview or in an article, if somebody asks me a question that I'm not sure about, I'd rather say, you know what? I don't know the answer. So let me go find out and I'll get back to you tomorrow. 
And so we do that on the air a lot that, you know, it, something will come up and we were talking last night about the last time so-and-so happened. And, you know, I said, I'm not sure about that. We looked into it a bit more today and here's the answer. And then maybe, you know, a follow-up. And that's where I lean on a guy like, like Dick Bramer or a guy like Stu Thornley, you know, historians, you know, Minnesota twins, baseball historians, Patrick Royce is another that I use those guys often for, for research, for questions, for knowledge, because it's more than just Googling something and finding out the answer. Maybe there's something else that was with the story that wasn't on Wikipedia or wasn't on an AP you know, site that, that Dick remembers because he was at the game or Patrick remembers because he covered the game or Stu remembers because he was at the game. That I think it's, it's fitting that the, that's part of your preparation, part of your homework. Don't dismiss that. But just always try to find out more and more. And it's never, you know, I'm 44 now and I still like learning new things. I never skied in my life. I've taken up skiing the last two years. Uh, I love paddleboarding. Never did that before. So I'm always trying to, to learn and, and, and just try to, to, to do better in my life. And sure, professionally, yes, but off the field as well, away from the booth. Anything that I can do to, to learn and grow, I'm all about it. So for me, just being honest with, with, with the fan base and not, not uh, dismissing you know, your, your story and your resume and not being dishonest about it. Um, so that, that's a part of it. And then when the moment's right, show them your passion. Show them that you care. Whether the team is 20 up, whether they're 20 down, and Herb wrote this in his book. He said that every day is a new game. Every game. Every day is a new game. Yes, the standings are going to change, but as it evolves, but still, still stick with that and, and give the fans, you know, a fun walk-off call if it's September 5th and they're 20 games out or if it's September 20th and they're 20 games up. Corey, you're employed by the Minnesota Twins, yet you don't seem to be afraid to call out poor play or poor effort by the hometown team when they deserve it. Do you ever feel any pressure to be a little bit of a homer uh, for the for the team? And, and how do you, you know, find that balance? The balance for me is I don't get into transactions. I don't get into if a guy screws up or a guy is struggling or if a guy is on the bench, I never get to... I don't know why he's up here. He's, he's got to be set back down. That, that, that's where I think you get in trouble. But so much of our, of our game more than ever is driven by stats, is driven by analytics. So if you're speaking of somebody's, of, of somebody's success, you have to back up the other side as well. When a guy is struggling, it's, it's factual. And when something we referenced often last year, that the Twins were among the worst base running teams in baseball last season, that wasn't just an opinion. That was statistically based. Now, you have to do some work to find it. You're not just going to find that on the, the SPN.com. You have to, there are websites that can go to, and some of it's subjective. I'm not saying it's perfect, but as long as I'm being honest, then I, I, I've not gotten myself in any hot water over anything I've said, because I'm basing it on fact that if the twins lead the American league in two strike home runs allowed, that's a something that I will say, and that's a factual Stat. And that's a factual conversation. It's not, I would imagine the Twins, with all these 0 2 home runs they've allowed, they must lead the American League. That's getting into, well, do they? So that's where I draw the line, Patrick. I, I, I'm, I'm fair. Um, I work for the team. I want them to win. I want them to succeed. But if you don't point out, you know, some of their, where they're inefficient and where they're struggling, then you're not being honest. You're not being credible. And if you lose your credibility with your audience, you have no chance. Corey, since you've been with the, the twins, you, you've worked for three different man, worked with, I should say, three different managers. You have Ron Gardenhire, you have Paul Molitor, and I have Rocco. Tell us the relationships you garnered with them. Has that helped you with information to better your broadcast? And how about dealing with them when things are going well and when things are not going well? I mean, Guardy was, I, I was so lucky. I mean, as everybody here knows, I mean, what a treat to be around Guardy my first year. He took care of me, man. He, he kind of, and I think the caravan experience, getting to know him, being on a bus for five days, um, you know, traveling out to the, to the uh, Dakotas was helpful. But 
you know, he just, he took really good care of me from the, from the outset. And he was always down for ask me anything you want. You may not get the answer you want, but ask me anything you want. And I would just know there were certain days if I had to ask him about something from the day before, ask it, but don't hammer at it time and time again. If you have to address something that happened, a, a decision he'd like to have back, fine. He would do it, but then you move on. Paul Molitor was very intellectual. And Paul Molitor gave me, and it just happened during an interview. And it's one of my favorite uh, pieces of advice. He didn't mean to do this. It just happened. And it's one of my favorite uh, pieces of advice I've ever heard. And I use this to this day that he, he just, I, I, I forgot how it came up. We're talking about the day before and a game that got away. And he said, you know, there's that expression to turn the page. It's okay to turn the page, but don't forget what you read. And I love that. And I'd use that forever. And I think that's applicable to anything you do in life, anything. I mean, forget baseball broadcasting, just anything you try to learn from. That's good. Learn, move on, but don't forget what you read. And so very intellectual and what he would study on his desk was different. He'd have some papers and all that stuff, but he would love to watch pick off moves from pitchers. He'd get out there early BP, take a ball, roll it down the first and third line. He want to see where the grass was cut, if there was gonna, if it was gonna roll a certain way, if it, a bunt was gonna go down. Those were things he was really, really keen on. And for Rocco, th this was his first time, you know, being a manager. So to understand. All the media that, 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 that is a part of it and the daily responsibility of, of doing, yes, your, your on-field job, balancing all the off-field job. We've been learning together and we have a great rapport. Uh, it began you know, for us in 19 and then 20. It was different doing all those interviews uh, over Zoom. And then we got back to being in the office uh, you know, full time here the last couple of years. So you know, Rocco is very, he's very cool to talk to. I like talking music with him. Um, more than anything else, we like talking about that. Paul Molitor, by the way, in his office at the, at the ballpark, he had a signed guitar from Springsteen. He had a signed guitar from Eddie Vedder. Uh, I mean, that oftentimes he'd be talking, I'd be looking at his wall. I mean, I, I don't care what he's talking about. I want to, I want to hear stories about his guitars. Um, so just really, I've been blessed to have these, these, these guys. And for me, it all began with Lou Pinella. I mean, I, I got to be around Lou Pinella every day with the Cubs and it'd be me, my Sano and Lou Pinella doing the, the manager show and Ronnie would tape it. I make sure it was being recorded, but then sometimes Ronnie couldn't do it. So I would do it, but talking with Lou Pinella, I mean, one of the true gentlemen and great uh, personalities in our game's history from him to, to Ken Maka and then Ron Renneke and then, you know, Guardy and, and Molitor and now Rock. Well, I've been very spoiled. That's great. Hey, Corey, we've been spoiled because this has been a terrific conversation not only are you truly one of the best broadcasters in the game, but you're a class act. And uh, thank you so much for carving some time out today. Went by in a hurry. I hope we can come back and do part two sometime soon. I'd love uh, to. Yeah, I'm sorry I rambled. I probably got too long-winded there. I'm sorry. Uh, great. No problem. Billy, great to see you as well. Gentlemen, uh, have a great weekend. Uh, look forward to seeing you both in person soon. And we'll be listening this season, Corey. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Take care. Thanks for watching Behind the Game.